All right, so um, like Vince said, I'm Adrian Tucka. I'm from Las Vegas, and there is more there than gambling and drinking and drugs, so <laughs> I needed to do my due diligence of saying that. Uh, but yeah, I'm here to talk to you today about delicious JavaScript. So over the course of my career, which has been going on nine years now, um, I've heard three common phrases from a lot of the coworkers that I've had, juniors, seniors, anyone that's worked in development, and they usually fall under one of these phrases, which is, JavaScript is hard. It is. Uh, if you take a look at everything that we have gone through from all the the rapid, uh, the rapid um, evolution of JavaScript from pre-ES 2015 to what it is today, you'll see that all of the syntax changes, all of the different things that have been added on top, it makes it really difficult to learn You know, what is what, what is this, or literally what is this, and uh, a lot of other things. JavaScript is also very hard if you're new to the language. So most developers, they tell me, you know, they get through HTML, awesome. They get through CSS, eh, still kind of, eh. And then you get to JavaScript and they're just, it's very difficult to kind of understand those dynamics of the language. Or if you're a senior developer or someone who has avoided JavaScript most of your career, once they start having to get into JavaScript, they always tell me it's very difficult, it's hard. Another thing that here is JavaScript is complicated. So as I mentioned before, the rapid evolution, all of the changes, it's really hard to keep up with it. And the, the other part about JavaScript is that it's paradigm agnostic. What I mean by that is there's no set correct way or style of writing JavaScript. I myself come from a C-sharp background. That's where my knowledge and education has been. So with C-sharp, I learned how to write and program in an object-oriented fashion. Uh, currently, I'm trying to move more into a procedural fashion with JavaScript, which is I explicitly write out and tell each instruction for the computer to do. And what I'm trying to migrate to, and what I hope to show you today, is more of a functional style of programming, which is anytime you do a, a function, the output should always be the same. It, um, rather than telling it each step to do, you, you let the computer take over. And with all of this, JavaScript is confusing. <laughs> I mean, I know myself, and this is what I look like most of the time. Even now, I still look at some JavaScript that I wrote back then, and this is exactly what I look like. So what do I do? With all of these things that we know that JavaScript is hard, it's complicated, it's confusing, what do I do? Well, for me personally, whenever I have a lot of issues in my life, I like to throw lots and lots of sugar at it. <laughs> and what I hope to do with that is do exactly that with this. So what I wanna to talk to you today about are three of the pretty most common, most powerful methods, which would be filter, map, and reduce in JavaScript. And in an Adrian fashion, I like to throw sugar at it, desserts at it, I have a sweet tooth, preferably pastries or baked goods. And so I hope to show you how they work and go line by line of what's actually happening when you use these functions. So the first one we'll start with is filter. And filter is fairly easy to understand. I mean, you can infer from the name what it does. But if you're like me, when you go to start using these functions, where do you go? You go to the docs. Well, how do you use it? What does it do? And we'll take the official Mozilla docs as an example. So they say for a filter, filter method creates a new array with all elements that pass the tests implemented by the provided function. Cool, but I think there's a better way to explain that. So let's say you have some food here, and for whatever reason, I have a donut, a couple cookies, uh, a random carrot, and a croissant. And let's say I want to only get out the cookies, because cookies are awesome, and who wouldn't want cookies? So naturally, we'll declare a variable of only cookies, because that's what we want. And we know that in order to get the cookies, we need to do something to, to this array. Just as we would look at this group of food in real life, we would say, hey, these are cookies, take those out, these are only cookies. So we do the same thing, but with filter. And although uh, this looks right, we know that we need to tell filter what to do, right? We wish we could do that and the computer would know <laughs> what we mean, but we need to give it a little extra help. So filter requires an expression, a question to answer. What do I do as I iterate through each item in my food array that says yes or no? 
And in this case, we want to say, is this a cookie or not? So that's the expression we put in there. We filter. We say, for every item in food, check it. So for the first one, it'll be, is this a donut? Does this equal a cookie? No. It does not pass the filter test. Next one, it's a cookie. It is a cookie. Yep, that goes in the only cookies result. And naturally, that would be the output if you console log that. So that's cool. Filter is pretty easy to understand. Now we're starting to move into some things that, for me at least, were getting a little bit more confusing, especially when you start adding them together. So map. Again, official Mozilla docs. It says, the map method creates a new array with the results of calling a provided function on every element in the calling array. Tell me again, but only tastier. So I have here a bag of marshmallows, and I choose to show that in the way that marshmallows usually would, right? Some are a little bit squished, more on the top, more on the bottom. So I decided to show that in this string array, uh, this string array here, where some of it's uppercase and lowercase. Now, because I really like marshmallows, I really like jumbo marshmallows. So what I want to do to this is, for every marshmallow that I take out of here, I have some jumbo Tron 3000 that's going to maximize all of these marshmallows. Make sure they're all jumbo marshmallows. So again, we're going to declare a variable called jumbo marshmallows because I like to be thorough and descriptive in what my result is going to be. And the same thing, we know we have to do something to the bag of marshmallows, right? And we can use map for that. But just as filter was, we need to pass an expression to map. This is where map is very, very powerful. You pass in what you want to do to every item in that array. So for map, what I want to do is make it jumbo. And because my marshmallows are strings, <laughs> I will take each one and return them as uppercase, as jumbo marshmallows. And cool, we have jumbo marshmallows now. But I'm sure you've noticed there's a random cloud in that array that's posing as a jumbo marshmallow, and it's not really a marshmallow. So what can we do about that? Well, this is where the power of JavaScript comes in because you can do something called chaining. With these methods, you can apply one thing, and after you do it, you can do the next thing. So in this example, what we want to do is make sure to filter out anything that's not actually a marshmallow, and then you do the uppercase function, and then you jumbo size those that are actually truly, in fact, marshmallows. So to change our function here, we're going to take the map function here, and instead of doing that first, we're going to move that down because, again, we only want to jumbo size those things that are actually marshmallows. And then because I'm thorough and I like to be descriptive, I might as well change my variable here that they're not only jumbo marshmallows, but they're filtered jumbo marshmallows. This helps me later on to say, you know, the original array that I had actually had this weird cloud in it that's posing as a marshmallow, uh, but now my final result has cleared those away. And now we can use something that we already know, filter, right? We want to filter out any random clouds first, and then we make them jumbo. So we use filter. We will filter our bag of marshmallows. And you know there are several ways to write this. This is not the only way. This is not the best way. But this is my way of testing to say, is this, in fact, uh, a marshmallow and not a cloud? In this case, I'm checking that it's not a cloud. So we filter our marshmallows, much like we would in real life, right? We would first filter this out, filter out all of the cl uh, things that are uh, not clouds, and make sure we return just the marshmallows. And then after that, we go through them, and now we uppercase them. We jumbo size them. And now you get what we were expecting, just full-size jumbo marshmallows with no random clouds. Awesome. So now we get to the one that strikes fear in every junior developer, especially me. When I first read this, I had to reread it and read it and reference it. And I don't promise you that you don't have to re-reference it, but what I would like to try to do is maybe demystify the different parts of it, especially in the documentation you might read online. So again, Mozilla Docs, right? Not helpful at all. The reduce method executes a reducer function that you provide on each element of the array, resulting in a single output value. Yeah, that's a mouthful, and it's not the sweet kind. <laughs> so I'm trying to show this in a different light. I want to put some sugar in it. 
So uh, I've been traveling a lot, and in every place that I go to, I like to get donuts. And I've heard here there are a couple. There's um, there's Brown's Bakery. I've heard is pretty good. There's Bell. There's uh, I know there's Pie Junkie, which that's not donuts, but I like sweets. And uh, please come to me afterwards because I would love your recommendations on where to get the best pies. But lately, the thing the thing I've been eating are donuts. And for me, I'd like to keep a track of how many I've been eating to see how terrible I've been. And so naturally, uh, you know, calories consumed is something that I'm concerned with because if I keep this going, I'm not going to be able to fit in these things anymore. So calories consumed. Now we're going to do the same thing. We're going to do something to the array. That's very much a pattern of all of these methods that we're using here. So we know we have to do something to donut log. And we want to use reduce to get to that single resulting calories consumed. That's the thing that we want to find, the total. And just like before, reduce needs, in this case, they make it sound a little bit more intimidating when they call it a reducer function. But it's very much similar to the other ones where you have to pretty much tell it what you want it to do. So this is where everyone starts to get like tripped out, right? Oh my gosh, what is this? This is different. <laughs> but in fact, it's really the same. It just sounds a little scary because they use some terms that you may not be familiar with, especially when I first started. I'm like, well, what is this doing? And to help with that, what these are doing is essentially, I'm going to change it so it makes more sense to me. So what the accumulator is, is essentially that thing we're keeping track of. And in this case, this is the last count of calories that we're going through. And then the current value is, as we are iterating through each item in our array, that is the one we are working with at that moment. So again, I changed it to current entry to denote the current entry in my log. With these name changes, they make it a little bit easier for me to understand what's going on. So now we have to do some actual math. We need to total all of the calories that we're consuming here, or in this case, I'm consuming. And this, this zero here is an optional value, but this is the initial value that you start with. So what this does is this, when you first run through the reduce function, the last count will be zero because hopefully I've been good and I haven't eaten any donuts yet. So it's zero. You're starting at zero. There's no calories that have been totaled, no previous calories that have been eaten. And then we get to the meat of it. You're just adding the last count, which when we start out would be zero, right? And then to that, as we iterate through each log, we say, how many have I eaten in the current entry? So for example, if our current entry right now is the first one. The day is Monday, and the total I've eaten is two donuts. So the two is returned, because we're on the current entry. Total eaten is two. And then we multiply that by this Googled uh, average amount of calories in every donut, which is 278. So you get that amount, you add it to the last amount, and then you return that. So now the new total here is, let's see, like five, 556, right? So the first day, last count is 556. And now when you go back and you get to Tuesday, you do the same thing, except now last count is not zero. Last count is now 556 because you calculated Monday's calories. So you keep going and going. And that's really what the, the accumulator is. That's what the reduce function does. You are adding something, you total something, and that's all that it's really doing. And that would be the output of all of the donuts I've eaten the last week. So that was a great week. And now I want to end with showing the true power of it, which is very much along the lines of chaining. So you'll see here, um, this morning I actually went to breakfast at a place called Kitchen Number 324 or 234. Has anyone been there before? It was very much recommended. I loved it. And I checked out the menu that they had and actually added some of the things that they had here. So they have a croissant, a uh, chocolate chunk cookie, some diner mug coffee, the Joe Nut of the day, I love that, and a gooey butter bar. And I only chose that because I could find uh, an appropriate emoji <laughs> that would match the name there. So what I want to show is, even though there are lots of fancy tools that you can use to, let's say, create a receipt, I want to show you that you can do this in plain JavaScript and with strings. It may not be the fanciest way, but it's possible. If you were ever in a need to create some sort of receipt, this example is for you. So here we start with our menu from uh, Kitchen 324 with some select items. Now what I want to do is, let's say I could order by emoji. 
So you pass in the emojis and you're able to get the total receipt of the items that you ordered and uh, the subtotal and the total, just like you would on our normal receipt. So let's do that. So this was my order. I ordered a Joe Nut of the day, a croissant, a diner, diner mug of coffee, and then I got two cookies to go. And based on Google, the Oklahoma combined sales tax is around 8.6%. Uh, you can correct me later, this is what Google says. So they have a constant there. And then the first thing we wanna do is get the receipt items ready. So as before, we're gonna do something and, and manipulate the menu. And from the menu, the first thing we wanna do is we wanna filter out the food that is actually part of my order. So this kind of looks intimidating. It looks a little bit more complicated than what I've shown you. But if you look at it just a little bit closer, you'll see it's really not that different from what it is. There may be a couple extra parentheses and things, maybe an extra function, but it's the same. So what we're doing is of the food that we are going through in the menu, check my order and we are using, using an includes that basically says, this, is this emoji part of my order? If so, that means that's the right menu item that we want and we filter those out. Next, we want to map those filtered items. So now that we took away any items that don't belong in my order, for each item that is part of my order, we want to do a small calculation here. We wanna say how many of that actual item did I order? So I just declare a quick variable here to say number ordered. And then again, the thing we can use filter again, we can use these functions, these methods to help us get to where we want uh, a lot quicker. So in this case, what I'm doing is for every order, I want to filter the number of emoji that's in my order and get the length back. And so you'll see all of the items there that I have would just be one, but when we're, when we're on the cookie, you'll know that I'll get two back. And that's really the only calculation I need to do to prep my receipt items. So what I wanna return so that I can actually use this in my receipt is the actual emoji. The price, which would be the price of the item times the number that I actually ordered and then the number ordered. Awesome, so we got our receipt items ready. Next, we wanna calculate the actual totals. So again, we're gonna go through our receipt items, and this time, totals, ring a bell, yeah, we're gonna use reduce. <laughs> so again, this looks a little intimidating, but it's not, and I'll explain to you why. So totals, just like in our last example, totals would be uh, akin to the last count of calories that I did. Totals are the totals that we want for our items. And then for our current entry, you'll see here I have price in curly braces, and it's the, what I'm doing here is something called destructuring. So if you remember, when I'm returning, I'm actually returning a lot more than just the price. I'm returning the emoji, I'm returning the number that I've ordered, but in this case, I only need the price. So by destructuring it and only getting the price, that's what I'm working with as I go through my reducer. And again, we're gonna declare some variables. I'm gonna do a subtotal, as well as sales tax. And from that, I will return these two items. And now this is our initial value here that we've started. So just like in our last example in the donut log, when I started with zero as the last count, it's similar here. And it doesn't have to be an individual number like you see before. This can be an object, much like I'm showing here. And I'm pretty much starting out with a subtotal is zero, sales tax is zero. So that's all that is, is the initial starting value. And like I said, there are prettier ways to do this. That uh, the, the point I'm trying to show here is that if you needed to print a receipt, you can do it uh, with these basic things. So this is basically just writing out the structure of what the receipt would look like. And if you console log that receipt, that's what it would look like. And you did all of that with just three methods, maybe four, because we use includes, okay. <laughs> but you could do all of that and have a pretty nice receipt to go along with it. And that's what I love about JavaScript and especially the methods here, if you do it in a functional fashion. You can chain these methods, you can do way more complex things than what I've shown you here, but if you understand the fundamentals of what they're doing, it becomes a lot simpler to see that if you're working on some sort of algorithm or breaking something down, maybe you can use one of these. And if you have these in your tool set, it becomes much, much easier to try solving these problems. 
So salamat, that means thank you in Tagalog, and that's pretty much all I have for you. If you have questions for me, please come find me, and you can find me here. So thanks.